Our reading this morning is taken from Mark's Gospel and chapter 12 and can be found on page 1017 and is also going to be available on the screen. Mark chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall round it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Nicky, very much. Please keep your Bibles open, because that's where we're going to spend our time this morning, uh, looking at this uh, well-known story. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you we're here. We thank you so much that we've got this teaching from Jesus, 2,000 years old, and we have it, and we can read it in our own language. We're so grateful. And we pray now that as we look at this parable that Jesus taught, that you'll teach us how to live under his rule and live for him day by day. Pray that for us as a church. Pray for it as individuals, uh, that we will not be uh, rebellious, but humble and submissive. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, here we are. Uh, it's more than a story, of course, isn't it? It's, it's a parable. You know what a parable is uh, in the Bible, anyway. Uh, a parable in the Bible is a story, an everyday story, uh, which has a message from God. And I hope we're going to hear that today. I've lived with it for the week. It's challenging. It's encouraging. Uh, so you will get a bit of both, I think, uh, from this uh, parable. We live in a, a world where there are lots of stories of tenants and... Landlords, uh, and you know, there's no shortage of them. I mean, there are landlords from hell uh, who let their tenants live in leaking roofs, with leaking roofs and mold growing up the wall, and they seem to have no concern. And we have tenants from hell as well uh, who don't pay their rent and uh, wreck the house. Uh, but this is a parable. Uh, that we're looking at, about a landlord from heaven who had tenants from hell. So you won't find a a story like this uh, in the media. Uh, But it's more than a parable. It's a prophetic story because Jesus prophesies what's going to happen to the tenants, uh, which did come to pass. And he also prophesies uh, what's going to happen to the landlord's son, which also came to pass. And unusually, this parable is understood by the listeners. That very often doesn't happen. People are clueless. I mean, the disciples 
lots of times just don't understand what Jesus is saying. But the listeners here do. Look at verse 12 there. Then the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he'd spoken the parable against them. So this is a parable particularly for leaders, religious leaders uh, in the Jewish faith. Um, I suppose in the Church of England, um, these leaders would be uh, the bishops perhaps, the clergy, uh, members of Synod, members of our PCC, um, home group leaders, standing committees. Uh, there's lots of leaders in this church when you start looking around. So if, this, if you're a leader here this morning, you should be on the edge of your seat because this is for you uh, and it's for me as well. Um, what is the vineyard in the parable? If we had a first century Jew here this morning, he would tell us immediately what it was. Uh, the vineyard in the Old Testament uh, is Israel. Um, and Israel was known uh, as God's vineyard. Uh, the vineyard uh, is the people of God today, um, who we would say, because Jesus is our saviour, is the church. So why is Jesus telling this parable? Well, we have to go to the previous chapter to find the answers to that, and you're going to have to work a bit hard at this point. So um, if you're cold, it might warm you up. Verse 15 of the previous chapter, Jesus entered the temple. And there's that famous time when Jesus drove out those who were buying and selling. Jesus overturned the temple of the money chain, uh, the tables of the money changers. He overturned the, be the benches of those selling doves, and he wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. It was a, an explosive moment. I mean, Jesus didn't normally behave like this, but he really turned the tables. Uh, and then in verse 27, it's the next morning. Um, you can check that out if you want to. Um, and Jesus is back in the temple. And in verse 28, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, those who understood what the parable was all about, have two very good questions for Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? First question. Second question, who gave you authority to do this? Now, they're excellent questions when it comes to religion. Uh, because authority in any religion is always a big question. Go to any of the religions around the world, they make big demands, uh, have big expectations, and ask for full commitment. And so it's right to ask, why have you got the authority to say this? So they were the right questions from these religious leaders. And in verses 29 to 33 of chapter 11, there's a discussion about authority. Where does Jesus get his authority from? But it's inconclusive. And so we arrive at chapter 12 and verse 1. So Jesus began to speak to them in parables. And this is a parable really about authority. Who's in charge? Who's running God's kingdom? This is a parable about, an, about authority among God's people. The vineyard is clearly Israel. The tenants are the people of God. The landlord is God. And there's a clash to who has the ultimate authority. Authority, of course, can be a dirty word to people, can't it? I mean, some of us have, in, have suffered injustices from those in authority. We've been badly treated. As we've seen authority abused, see it most days actually. Uh, many of us have a built-in suspicion of authority. Uh, and this is not just a 21st century issue. I reckon it takes us right back to the Garden of Eden, where God's authority there was under suspicion and then ignored. So I want us to look at this parable under two headings. The first is, I want us to look at the tenants from hell, and then we're going to look at the landlord uh, from heaven. So first of all, the tenants uh, from hell. Why did the tenants reject the landlord's authority? Verses 1 to 8. Their rejection 
of authority, of their authority, started in verse 2. The landlord at harvest time sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Now, this arrangement uh, would have been part of most rental agreements in the first century. The uh, landlord would expect from his fathers uh, a cut of the crop. But can you see what has happened to the tenants? They acted as if they're the owners of the vineyard. The landlord was out of sight, out of mind, and they were now in charge. They did it again, verse 4. He sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. Again, verse 5. The landlord sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. So who's Jesus talking about here? Well, those of you who know the Old Testament would realize that this is Israel. Uh, Elijah, an Old Testament prophet, ran for his life. Zechariah, murdered. Isaiah, tradition tells us, was sawn in two. Jeremiah, thrown into prison. Ezekiel, treated as a joke. John the Baptist, the last of the prophets, was beheaded. And it's been just the same since Jesus was here. Stephen was stoned by Jewish authorities. James was executed by Herod, who was a Jew. A lot of the letters in the New Testament were written to local churches where the local church was wondering whether to believe the apostles who had the authority of Jesus or whether to follow the new teachers who were arriving. At the Reformation, it happened. It was conflict. Who's in charge around here? Is it the Pope? Or is it Jesus Christ through the Bible? This uh, struggle was seen 20 miles down the road in Oxford. Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley, all burnt at the stake. Why? Because they wanted the authority of the Bible to be supreme in the church. So the religious authorities burnt them at the stake. I lived in Basingstoke in the 1980s. Um, George Whitfield, uh, the great Bible teacher of the 18th century, uh, was in Basingstoke, and it was the first town where he was physically attacked. Who attacked Mr. Whitfield? The vicar of St. Michael's Church. Because he organized some of the local toughs uh, to uh, beat him up and chase him out of town. That's what happened. And it's still happening today in the Church of England. Uh, there are Bible-believing uh, ministers who are having a very rough time. And they're being marginalized and ignored. Uh, and some have even got into serious trouble because they want to stick to the Bible. And so in the Church of England, we still have the same choice. It looks like to me that we have this choice in every generation. If you look at church history, who are we going to listen to? Do we listen to our culture? Or do we listen to the, what God has to say? Are we going to follow Jesus Christ? Or are we going to follow religious leaders? We have to make these choices. This is nothing new. It's been happening all through history. All through the Old Testament, this story's happening. It's happened through the church. And we, and we must say that actually if we decide to be Bible Christians, then we will not end up as some sad little cult in history. This morning, 85% of the global Anglican church, I mean, that is how good God has been to the Church of England uh, in its history. 85% of the Church of England is outside of this country. Praise God for that. And they are Bible Christians. They're Bible people. They've decided they want to listen to what God's going to say and not follow the crowd. And it is Bible people who survive in the long term. It may look bad in the short term, but long term, they're always the winners. Not because we're better, 
Not because we're any good or we've got it right, but because Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The word of God is eternal. It's, that's where we get our authority from. That's the authority we live under. Because Jesus said, the Bible's all about me. The Bible takes us to a person. We're not legalists. We don't just want to follow a book. We want to follow a person. Jesus is the one we love and the one we serve. But the story's about to get worse. Verse 6. The landlord had one left to send, a son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. This prophecy was only days away from being fulfilled. This is probably Monday or Tuesday um, of the week when Jesus was crucified. So Good Friday, this was going to come true. We must notice verse 12. The chief priests and the elders knew that Jesus was speaking to them. I mean, they could have stopped their rebellion at that moment. And they could have recognized the truth of what Jesus was saying. I'm amazed how in the Bible God forgives some of the biggest rogues around. I mean, go and read about Manasseh. I'm always shocked that he gets forgiven. Or Ahab, he was a real thug. But God forgave him. David wasn't much better. I mean, Paul, the apostle, he used to kill Christians. But God forgave him. God has the great power to forgive people if they'll just turn around and come to Jesus. And there may be someone here and you're in real rebellion against God this morning. It's never too late. It wasn't too late for these guys. They didn't have to die AD 40, AD 70. They could have been saved. But they didn't. They wanted to keep control. They wanted to be in charge. Because this is the history of the world, isn't it? We love to be in charge. It's the history of Israel. It's the history of the church. We want the power and the authority. This is exactly the opposite of what Jesus said in an invitation back in Mark 8. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You see, this church that we belong to here it's not our church this is Jesus church Jesus is lord of the church Jesus has the authority we're his tenants we're always answerable we're called to deny ourselves and to follow him and to be like him Jesus was so humble and meek and gentle they're the qualities we're to have not to be bossy and very religious. So that's the tenants from hell. It's better news now. Uh, we're now going to look at the um, landlord. Landlords are often not popular. I was talking to a landlord at the end of the 9.30 service. Uh, and they're not popular. Um, but now we're going to look at a landlord who has perfect authority. In fact, you could say it was almost beautiful authority. We don't often see it in our world, but this is a great model of what authority should look like. So that's our second question, why the la landlord has perfect authority. It's very obvious, isn't it? He owned the vineyard. Uh, he planted the vineyard, and there's no doubt uh, that he was in charge. But power brokers are not always the nicest of people. But this is the landlord from heaven. Look at his generosity to the tenants, verse 1. He put a wall around them for security. He dug a pit for a wine press so they could produce their own wine. He built a watchtower so they could see what's happening outside and inside. 
And the landlord has been generous to his people all through history. You've only got to read the Bible. God is so generous. He gives us his own spirit. Isn't that unimaginable? That Almighty God will give his spirit to the followers of Jesus. He's given us here his spirit. He's given us his word to teach us and encourage us and help us. He's given us his son as a savior on a cross. He's become our father. So we have someone to look after us and to guide us and to lead us and take care of us. You know, you can't find generosity anywhere else like this, can you? This is our landlord. He's amazingly generous. And then look at the patience of the landlord. He kept sending servants to the tenants. So verse 2, he sent a servant to the tenants. Verse 4, he sent another servant. Verse 5, he sent still another. Verse 5 again, he sent many others. There's no doubt that the landlord wanted to sort things out with these uh, tenants. He wanted to rescue them from their road of destruction. And then in verse 6, this is the extent of the landlord's love for these tenants. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But you may ask, what kind of a father would send his son to these thugs? I mean, the landlord has already seen how he treated all his servants. I mean, some of us are fathers here. Would we send our son to such scoundrels who are going to beat our son up? Very unlikely. Yet we're told in verse 6 that specifically the landlord loved his son. And we know the son loved the father. And we know there's a wonderful relationship between the two. So there's no coercion here. And they both, father and son, were willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice out of their love for these tenants. That's the love the landlord had for the tenants. A love that God has for all of us here. It doesn't matter who we are, whether we're followers of Jesus or not, it doesn't matter. God loves us all the same. And he has this love that we see for the tenants. Graham Kendrick uh, wrote about the cross in this way. Such love springs from eternity. Such love streaming through history. Such love, fountain of life to me. Oh Jesus, such love. Amazing, isn't it? That's the love of God. And that's what the, uh, the tenants did, tragically. They killed him. Verse 8, they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Jesus then asked a question, verse 9, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? When Jesus asked questions, he often waited for a reply. He didn't on this occasion because the answer is so obvious. Yes, the landlord is generous. Yes, he's patient. Yes, he's full of love. But thankfully, the landlord is also full of justice. He's not a sentimental old man. He is a God of justice. And while it's uncomfortable to hear the judgment of God, Martin Luther called it God's strange work. Yet, we still need justice in this world. It would be dreadful if God overlooked the evil of this world. It would be a great travesty of justice if nothing was ever done about all that is wrong on our planet, all the pollution and all the badness and all the darkness. And as we go through the Bible, 
there are moments of judgment and surely they're there to remind us that a day of judgment is coming. We can't be Bible people and avoid seeing that. And so verse 9 here, we have one of the judgments mentioned. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And that's exactly what happened. 40 years later, AD 70, the Roman Empire moved in with its army and Jerusalem was flattened. It's a very serious reminder that the God of the Bible does bring judgment even upon his own people. It happened to Israel through the Old Testament when they were going through the wilderness on the way to the promised land, judgment. It happened to the rebellious kings in Chronicles. Oh, yes, please. I'd love a glass of water. Thanks, Charlie. I'm sorry, I think it's old age. My mouth gets very dry. It happened to the rebellious kings in Israel, came under judgment. It happened in 587 BC. Jerusalem was again just destroyed uh, by the Babylonian army with the Babylonian, from the Babylonian Empire. Judgment is a danger for us as God's people um, because he wants us to be holy. He wants us to be his people. And we do have to learn from these passages and take notice of them. Why did the tenants think they could get away with it? That's the amazing thing. Why did they ignore all those servants? Why did they kill the landlord's son? They were living in a fool's paradise. May God prevent us from ending up in such a paradise. I mean, why do we think in parts of the Church of England that we can ignore God's word and God's ways and rewrite it for the 21st century? It's madness. This is God speaking. How can we play around with it? Paul wrote to the Galatians, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Well, the parable's over. But Jesus gives a little PS, verse 10. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's a verse from Psalm 118. And Jesus is telling us what it means. The landlord's son actually was never going to be received. He's always going to be rejected by the people but the son may have been rejected by the tenants but the Lord was going to make him the cornerstone of God's temple that's the church we are now the temple of God and Jesus as the cornerstone means he supports the whole universal church and so there are millions of us on this Sunday morning all over the world praising Jesus Christ and he's our Lord the cornerstone the one that's holding the whole thing together the whole weight of it is on him he's our saviour that's why we can know that our sins are forgiven when we say the confession and we repent Jesus will forgive us he's the cornerstone he's the king of kings the Lord has done this Jesus says there and it is marvellous in our eyes. It is marvellous in our eyes, isn't it? This parable is the gospel. It's the good news of Christianity. Yes, Jesus was killed by the tenants, rejected by the world, sometimes ignored by the church. But this morning, he is the cornerstone. He's the king. He's the one who's going to have the last say in this world. And we're going to see him personally and majestically what a day it's going to be but don't let's be like the tenants let's submit 
to Jesus as our Lord. Let's live for his glory and let's follow him day by day. And now we can do nothing less but uh, really stand and sing this final hymn, Christ Alone, Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love, through the storm, he is Lord of all.